I love the subject of typology because it's going to connect us to an ancient way of reading the Bible. Uh, the great tradition across the 2,000 years of church history um, have multitude of examples and theologians who are trying to understand the Bible, the Old Testament specifically, in light of what the apostles say about the Old Testament. Um, I think about the Lord Jesus when he's in Luke 24. He's risen from the dead. He's teaching his disciples. And what he tells them is that the law, the prophets, and when he says Psalms, he's meaning that third large section, the writings, um, this is a reference to the whole Old Testament and that it testifies to him and that what's written of him in the law, prophets, and writings must be fulfilled. That's a fascinating claim because the Lord Jesus is telling us and teaching his disciples in the intervening weeks how to read the Old Testament and to see Christ in the Old Testament. In order to get our minds around the subject of typology, we need to see that typology is a way of reading earlier things in light of later things. That those later things provide some kind of clarity or light. And Christological types, it's a way of saying with that subject, there are foreshadowings of Jesus in the Old Testament. There are people and events. There are offices and things. There are places that typify or foreshadow or anticipate what he is coming to do. Now, Old Testament types, it can sometimes be defined as a person or an event or an institution. You know, what do we have in mind here? Well, you could say people like David is a type of Christ. David is a suffering king. Christ is a suffering king. And David was vindicated and the Lord Jesus is vindicated, both by resurrection and ascension. David's life anticipates Christ in a way we can use that term type to talk about him as an Old Testament character. Uh, not just David, Moses is a type of Christ. Moses is a mediator. Moses is a lawgiver. Uh, Moses is an Exodus leader. These are elements of Moses' life that correspond to the Lord Jesus. Things like the bronze serpent. In Numbers 21, you have this bronze serpent lifted up, and all that look to the bronze serpent are delivered from death and judgment. Jesus brings up the bronze serpent. In John 3, verses 14 and 15, the Son of Man has to be lifted up like that bronze serpent was, and that any who look to the Son of Man will not perish. Not only do we have people and things, you have examples of offices. The office of priesthood, the office of the king, the office of the prophet. All of these are Old Testament ways of reaching later into Old Testament history to see fulfillment in Christ. He's our ultimate prophet, priest, and king. You have earlier events like the mighty Exodus and the judgment upon the Egyptians or the crossing of the Jordan River when the conquest was happening. These are important events in the historical timeline of Israel's history. And yet, by God's grace and providential ordering, they are to anticipate later events in the life of Jesus, where Jesus will cross the Jordan in a sense of being baptized and coming up out of those waters, and his conquest will look like subduing demonic powers and overcoming ailments and disease and even raising people from the dead. That's better than defeating Jericho and Ai. It's as if those, those earlier events in Israel's history are being swept up in a greater transposed level of glory in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. Uh, you can look at other examples that are mentioned. Jesus in Matthew 12 says that something greater than the temple is here. Uh, something greater than Solomon is here. These are uh, comparative statements where earlier people or even places like the temple have a role by God in his providential ordering of human history to foreshadow what Jesus would do. We have to assume, therefore, a unity of the two testaments if typological reading is gonna be a legitimate enterprise. If you don't have a unity of the Testaments and a progressive revelation from the Old to the New Testament, then typology is simply in the clever mind of the subjective reader and their imagination. Instead, however, if the divine authorship of Scripture has established a unity of the Testaments, and by his providence he has ordered human history to where people and places and events and things foreshadow what his Messiah would do for us, then the divine authorship of the Scriptures, its, its inspiration and authority, establishes for us and is the foundation for typological interpretation. Uh, we want to read the Old Testament to behold Christ because Jesus taught his disciples that the Old Testament testifies of him. And when you read the Gospels, Acts, and the letters in Revelation, uh, the New Testament authors see types of Christ in the Old Testament. 
Now, a listener might rightly wonder, well, how many types are we talking about? Like, is this just scattered here or there? Is this a rare event? Well, um, I wrote a book on typology in 2020 called 40 Questions About Typology and Allegory. And I tried to show 100 Christological types in the Old Testament. That's a big number. Um, now, the difficulty with, with reading types in the Old Testament is that once you're suggesting types that haven't been identified by the New Testament authors, there might be some disagreement among Christians. Someone might say, well, I think this figure could serve as a type of Christ. And someone else might say, well, I'm not so sure. You know, an example might be Isaac. Isaac is taken by Abraham to this mountain in Genesis 22. Isaac is going to be given for sacrifice, and he's got the wood on his shoulders, and he's ready to lay down his life uh, as his father is going to bind him for that offering. Now, the New Testament never tells us that Isaac is a type of Christ. But theologians throughout church history have been convinced that the way we see the New Testament authors reading the old should be a method we imitate, being willing to see correspondences and escalation between things in the Old Testament and the Old Covenant realities, uh, escalating toward the New Covenant realities of Christ and his church. Uh, so I would suggest that Isaac is a type of Christ and that the New Testament doesn't exhaust all of the types in the Old Testament, and we can see how they are identifying types in order to give us some rising confidence to see some as well. However, we can think about some criteria. Um, we, we may still um, run the risk one way or the other of underseeing Christ or overseeing Christ in the Old Testament. This is because as interpreters, uh, we are not inspired apostles. However, if we can see types that have been verified in the New Testament, like a type of, uh, of Christ in the life of David, or a type of Christ in the life of Abraham, or a type of Christ in the story of Jonah, and then we can see other stories in the Old Testament which parallel those. We can see unidentified types when those stories or episodes parallel identified types. Let me give you an example of a controversial passage in the book of Joshua. There's a lot of discussion in church history about Rahab's red scarlet cord. All right, so is the scarlet cord of Rahab, does that have anything do, to do with Christ? When you read Joshua chapter two, it doesn't look like it has anything to do with Christ. They said, hang the cord in your window, judgment will pass over your house. Now, why have theologians in church history been willing to see something of the cross? Well, sometimes the argument is the color red in both stories. That's not an argument I want to make. I think that's overdoing uh, an imagery of a color. Instead, I would want to think about what textual arguments could you bring to the table to see something typological in that event. And, uh, and what we're trying to do is see episodes in a broader context than just the initial chapter and in just the initial book. Um, for instance, the book of Joshua opens with the Israelites having uh, come through a mighty exodus and a wilderness wandering. They're ready to cross the Jordan River and enter the Promised Land. Now, Rahab has gotten wind, as well as the others in Canaan, that the Israelites are coming and they know what God has done to those Egyptians in years gone by. Rahab is ready to confess allegiance to Yahweh. She believes that God has promised the land of the Israelites and he will most certainly give it to them. And, and she doesn't want to be caught on the wrong side of history or on the wrong side of worship. So she's going to worship the living God and she's going to put all the chips on the table, if you will, for, for that allegiance. And what happens is the Israelite spies say to hang this, this cord in her window and then judgment will pass over. If we remember the book of Exodus, we will recall that there was going to be something on someone's household in the 10th plague. There was going to be a soldering of a lamb and blood on the doorposts and the, and the doorway at the top of it, the lintel, so that when judgment came, all those who were covered by the blood of the lamb, judgment would pass over those homes and everybody in there would be spared, in particular the firstborn son. What if that template is being reworked in, in a similar way with the Rahab cord, that this scarlet cord is meant to remind us of putting something on a household so that when judgment is coming to a particular region, it passes over and spares those within. Now, what, what do we know about the Exodus story in light of the whole biblical canon? Well, Jesus is the, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5 that Jesus is our Passover Lamb who has been sacrificed. In other words, if we are covered by God's ordained means of deliverance, then we shall be delivered if we are trusting in that. 
Uh, in the book of Exodus, it was the Passover lamb. And in Joshua 2, it's the cord of Rahab. It's not because there was anything magical in that cord. But if she would be properly marked and trust that when the armies came, that the Israelites would pass over with judgment her home and head to others, then uh, she would be delivered. It's that pattern of trusting in what has been declared so that deliverance could be received by those who trust in faith. And that is why theologians throughout church history have seen value in the court of Rahab. There may be plenty of interpreters who say, I'm just not sure. It's just not clearly identified in the New Testament. Listen, I get that, I get that. But consider the textual argument that's being made. What we're trying to do is see the story of Joshua and how it connects to what has been previously identified as a type, the Passover lamb episode, the Exodus. If you can show parallels of an identified type to something unidentified, then maybe what you can do is you are imitating now the apostles and you can rightly put forward the story of Rahab as a type of Christ with that scarlet cord. Now, uh, where does this all come down in terms of practical application? What, why, what is the benefit? for believers thinking about typological interpretation. I'm thinking about that couple walking on the road with Jesus to the village where they live, the village of Emmaus. I think what's important is what they later reflect on as Jesus had taught and walked with them. As he spoke about the Christ, according to the Old Testament scriptures, their hearts were filled with warmth within. And I think that figure of speech is a way of saying that their joy and their hope was inwardly stirred because they beheld the promises and patterns of the Messiah in the Old Testament through the instruction Jesus was giving. Typological interpretation is a valuable study because as readers, our souls are stirred and encouraged as we behold Christ. Now, we can read his explicit teachings in the Gospels, but what if we can also exult in Christ and have our joy stirred to behold him in the Old Testament? Well, throughout church history, we would call that beholding Christ through typological reading. And seeing types of Christ in the Old Testament stirs our joy in Christ in beholding him and our trust in the scriptures as divinely inspired because of the coherent united testaments of the old and the new. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this content, visit sbts.edu sample to access free theology lectures from Southern Seminary.